And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here virtually. I hope everyone is staying safe in these strange pandemic days. Um, the, uh, the rates are coming down in the United States. They're coming down very dramatically. So perhaps there is light at the end of this ridiculous tunnel that we have been in in the last year or so. Uh, the talk I'm going to be giving today is a, a lightweight talk, which is appropriate since this all started with the Lightweight Methods Conference. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen and we will talk about Clean Agile. <laughs> now, um, much of what I'm going to tell you is my own personal recollections over the last 20 years. Um, it's not a technical talk. You may be a programmer, you may not be a programmer, it does not matter. Just think of this as some old guy telling the young Agile kids to get off his grass. <laughs> Agile, Agile has become many things, unfortunately, but it began as a small idea. It was a small idea about the small problem of small programming teams doing small things. That is probably not a popular viewpoint right now, but that is how Agile began, as a small idea. And the small idea was actually very old. It came from the 1950s. It was the way that programmers worked oh, on the Mercury space capsule or on the avionics software of early fighter jets or, or the missile control software of atomic submarines in the 1960s. It was a, a small idea for small teams doing relatively small things. In the last few years, we have tried to turn Agile into a big thing idea, and we have lost much of what Agile really was and ought to be. This change probably occurred right around the 1970s. Before the 1970s, we had no named method we did not know what process we used. The process we used was very much like Agile. But then in the 1970s, there were so many new programmers pouring out of universities, all very, very young, I was one of them, that um, we needed a process to somehow corral these young programmers and keep them all in line. And the waterfall process came along at just the right time and made it possible to at least say that we had a process, a process which unfortunately did not work very well. Before I continue, I think there's some acknowledgements we ought to make here. I'm, I'm going to name a few people. The images you see here, Kent Beck on the left, Ward Cunningham on the right. Of all the people I'm going to mention, these are probably the two most essential in the creation of Agile, in the furtherance of Agile. Kent Beck is the fellow who wrote a wonderful book, I, which I hope many of you have read, called Extreme Programming Explained, a book written in 1999, I believe it was. And his teacher was Ward Cunningham. Ward Cunningham was the mentor, not only of Ward, but of many of us. And in some way, most of the things that we now call agile can be traced back to the imaginings of Ward Cunningham. Someone else who needs to be mentioned is Martin Fowler, because in the early days of agile, there was very much enthusiasm. And as you know, enthusiasm can go off track. It was Martin Fowler more than anyone who kept us on the right track. He had a, a calming way of redirecting things back onto the appropriate, the appropriate way. Someone else who should be mentioned is Ken Schwaber. Ken Schwaber is the person 
probably most responsible for getting business to accept Agile. And he did this by creating, perhaps fortunately, perhaps unfortunately, the Certified Scrum Master course, which attracted the attention of managers and project managers all around the globe. <laughs> Whether you agree or do not agree, it was that one thing that drove Agile in front of so many people. And then of course, there are the Poppendicks, Mary and Tom Poppendick, who, who were always present at every Agile event. Mary gave of her time uh, very generously. She became the first secretary of the Agile Alliance. She did all of the work to set up a nonprofit organization. She was there at every, every, every step and was a, a, a thought leader in her own right. She gave many talks and made many encouragements. Tom, her husband, was always with her, always smiling as you see him there, and was the official photographer of Agile after the Snowbird meeting. Someone else who needs to be mentioned is Ron Jeffries. Ron Jeffries is the warm and gentle conscience of the early days of Agile. Whereas Martin Fowler somehow had his hand on the tiller, on the rudder, it was, it was Ron who was looking out the front of the boat, peering through the fog and making sure that our, our hearts were in the right place. And then there's Mike Beadle. Mike Beadle was a, a, an endless font of energy, always had ideas, always, always put forth a great effort and was unfortunately murdered on the streets of Chicago by a homeless person just a few years ago as a rather odd statement about our, our uh, world today. Many other people should be mentioned, of course. Here's the remainder of the folks who are at the, at the Snowbird meeting, Ari Van Benicum and Alistair Coburn, James Grenning, Jim Highsmith, Andrew Hunt and John Kern, Brian Merrick, Steve Meller, Jeff Sutherland, and Dave Thomas, the pragmatic Dave Thomas. And one last person to mention is my business partner at the time, Jim Newkirk, who put forth boundless amounts of energy uh, working against uh, incredible personal headwinds to drive the idea of agile forward in those very early, very formative days. So let's take a look at a little introduction. What was this agile stuff? How did it all begin? And one of the pictures you saw at the beginning of this was this very famous picture, which was taken by Ward Cunningham at the decisive moment at the, at the Snowbird meeting. 17 of us met in February of 2001. I can't remember the exact date. And we met to discuss the deplorable state of software. The name of our meeting was the Lightweight Process Summit, a name that we all hated because who wants to be associated with something that's lightweight? Agile was born in that meeting, or, or maybe I should say it was reborn because Agile had been around for a long time in one way or another, but the ideas came together again and we put them in that manifesto. But how did all of this begin? What happened before that meeting? Where did Agile really come from? It probably started 50,000 years ago. I, and, and I just say that because that's somewhere roughly around the time that human beings began to work in collective groups and, and do things together. The, um, the idea of choosing small intermediate goals and measuring the progress after each goal is just too intuitive and too human to be considered any kind of revolution. I imagine the very first time a team of ancient humans got together to do some project, perhaps the hunting of a mastodon, uh, they worked in an agile way. I presume they made plenty of mistakes and iterated their way to the point where they could finally take down the mastodon and harvest the meat. 
In modern industry, it's hard to say how agile came into it, although it is very difficult to imagine that the first steam engine, for example, was built out of whole cloth. I imagine that the fellows who made a steam engine had to try over and over again through many iterations to gradually approach a functioning steam engine. Certainly we know that was the case for airplanes. We know the Wright brothers and how they worked and they iterated and iterated and iterated until they eventually achieved the first powered flight. And, and once again, taking small measured steps is just too natural and too human for any of these things to have happened any other way. If you want to learn more about the early history of Agile, this is a wonderful book, Agile and Iterative Development, A Manager's Guide, written by Craig Larman. In this, he talks about the very early days of software and, and how the, the programmers in the 60s and the 50s organized themselves. And as you read through that, you will, you will see that much of this was Agile. One, one thing I will mention specifically, the programmers who wrote the avionic software for the Mercury space capsule wrote their unit tests in the morning and made them pass in the afternoon. If you thought test-driven development was a new idea, it was not. <laughs> but Agile was not the only game in town. Early on, there was a competing idea and not a bad idea, just a competing idea. And it is most identified with this fellow, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Frederick Winslow Taylor might be the first person to uh, be considered a management consultant. His idea was that we should plan things out and plan them well and study well and, and measure scientifically the best way that a plan can be produced. He actually is the author of a very significant amount of work, very, very valuable work. And he invented techniques that revolutionized the manufacturing industry in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. The success of the Industrial Revolution cannot be traced to him, but was certainly vastly helped by the work of Frederick Winslow Taylor. But the idea here that he had was counter to Agile, whereas Agile approaches a conclusion through a sequence of very small steps, scientific management designs the solution after much study and much analysis and much design. These two ideas were competing with each other in the 1970s for the attention of software developers. Software developers had been using something like Agile, something informal like Agile, but they were confronted by the ideas of scientific management. A fellow by the name of Winston Royce wrote a paper in 1970 something in which he outlined the idea of the waterfall process. <laughs> now, ironically, the paper that he wrote was trying to suggest that this would not be a good idea. Unfortunately, he put that diagram on the first page of his paper. And I believe that many people did not read his paper. They just looked at the first page, believed they understood the paper, and then copied that diagram over and over and over again into many, many other documents. And the idea of waterfall spread throughout the software industry. I was a very young man at the time. I was about 18 and I was hired as a programmer at a company. And I remember when that diagram, that waterfall diagram appeared in the trade journals. We didn't have uh, an internet in those days. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't learn on, on Reddit or any of the social networks. We read magazines in those days. We read trade journals. <laughs> and in the trade journals was that picture and an article that described how waterfall would work. It was not called waterfall. People named it that later. It was simply presented as a rational technique for getting software done. And I recall as a young man, 
thinking that it was sheer genius, just wonderful. We would do all the analysis first. And when we were done with the analysis, we would design and we would create a perfect design. And then at the end of the design phase, the implementation phase would be trivial. It's what we thought, we believed it. For 30 years, we believed it. For 30 years, we tried and tried and tried to make that work. Now, we should uh, say that software in those days looked a lot like this. <laughs> in the 1970s, programmers did not work on a laptop. There were no laptops. They did not work at a desktop. There were no desktop computers. When they wrote code, they wrote code on pieces of paper using a pencil. Programmers in those days did not know how to type. <laughs> they were not experienced with keyboards. They wrote their programs with pencil and paper and then handed them to other people who knew how to type. And those people would punch those programs onto punch cards. This usually took a day or two. So you would get your deck of cards after writing your program. You would get your deck of cards a day or two later. You would scan through them, reading them because they were printed on the top. And you'd have to correct several of them because the people who punched them did not really know what they were typing. Eventually you would get your programming deck into a, a state that you thought was worthy of a compile. And then you would hand that deck to a computer operator who would take it into the computer room and at three in the morning, run your compile. Programmers were not allowed to touch the computer. Programmers were not allowed in the computer room at all. At three in the morning, after all the real work was done, the operators would run the compiles of the programmers, tear off the listings and put them on a table outside the door of the computer room. And the programmers the next day, or perhaps two days, would get their listings and look through their listings and find out, of course, that they had forgotten a comma. This is what programming was like in the 1970s. The cost of change was very high because of this process. A single error could cost you a day or two. So we spent a lot of time planning and studying and so forth. So the idea of waterfall was not insane. <laughs> because the cost of change was so high, the idea of planning and being very careful was necessary. And so this was not an absurd thought in the 1970s. But it dominated us for 30 years. For 30 years, we tried and tried to make it work. And <laughs> 30 years of failure mm, was difficult for us to imagine. We could not understand why this waterfall approach did not work well. And as time went on, it worked worse and worse and worse. Nowadays, we can look back and see why the cost of change was shrinking enormously. By the time the 90s rolled around, a compile took you 30 or 40 minutes. Does anybody remember out there when a compile took an hour? <laughs> A compile of 10,000 lines or 20,000 lines would take an hour if you included the link time. Oh, yeah. Well, many of you have no idea. <laughs> but that was true. The level of indoctrination that Waterfall put us through was so, so huge that it infected everything else. When Alan Kay came out with object-oriented programming, Immediately, we had to have object-oriented analysis and object-oriented design as well. Books were published with those titles. <laughs> Peak Code published books, OOA, OOD, OOP. We split everything into three. When structured programming came out in 1968, it immediately split into three. Structured analysis, structured design, structured programming. There were books with those titles in them. <laughs> Everything had to be split into three because we believed in waterfall. We could not conceive of another way to work. And then one day, suddenly we could. <laughs> and, and, and it started with Grady Booch, probably, who wrote this wonderful book, Object-Oriented Analysis and Design with Applications, in which he talked about 
the, the possibility of continuous integration and the quick rhythm of a, a development process. And you, Alistair Coburn was already working on, on his processes, the crystal processes, the crystal methods. Jim Copeline had written a paper in 1994 about how the best software teams worked and they, they didn't work using waterfall. They worked in small steps. The scrum paper came out in 1995. Ken Schwaber, Mike Beadle, and Martine DeVoe wrote this paper. It was presented at the Patterns Conference in 1995. And, and this is where I pop into this picture again. This 30 years later, I'm now a C++ consultant. And my customers, you know, they hired me because I was a C++ expert and an object-oriented design expert. And I, I would go in and help them design their code. I, I was a techie. I still am a techie. And then they would ask me this question that I could not answer. What process should we use? And I thought, oh, I don't know what process you should use. I'm not a process guy. I'm a programmer. Ask me a technical question. But so many of them asked me that question that I started to do some research. And as I did this research, I bumped into Kent Beck. Kent Beck was part of the patterns community. He was in my, in my community. And I started to read his work on extreme programming. And this excited me. The ideas in the extreme programming book I thought were very interesting, except for this test first nonsense. I didn't think that was worthwhile at all. But the rest, working in short cycles and estimating in points, this stuff really kind of got me going. And I, uh, I happened to run into Kent Beck surely by accident. Uh, in Germany, in Munich, in 1999 at the OOP conference. And I was teaching uh, in one room and he was teaching across the hall in another room. And uh, the two of us happened to see each other on a break. And I, I said to him, Kent, I need you to do me a favor. It turned out at the time I was the editor of the C++ Report, one of the last of the trade journals and magazines that was being published. And I asked him to write a column in the C++ report describing extreme programming, which he did. And I was so enthusiastic about the column he wrote and about the, the ideas he had, I, I suggested that we meet in, at his home in Medford, Oregon. So I flew out to Medford, Oregon, and I spent two days with Kent Beck working out what extreme programming meant to C++ programmers in general, because that's who I was. And it was at that meeting at his home where he sat me down and the two of us wrote code for about two hours using this test first idea. And I had, I had never seen anything like that in my life. I never thought, you know, I've been a programmer for over 30 years at that point. I never thought anybody would show me some new way to write code, but there it was staring me in the face. And it was two hours of writing code without ever debugging and getting everything to work without ever debugging. And I was sold. I had to go home and study it. Kent and I collaborated with many other people on a set of courses that we taught called Extreme Programming Immersions. We taught them all over the United States. They were extremely popular during the late 90s as the dot-com bubble was preparing to burst. <laughs> Kent, at one point, called a meeting of all of the extreme programming experts and we all went out to Medford, Oregon again to meet there. And, and we had this long discussion about what we should do about extreme programming. And the end result of that meeting was that we should do nothing. And this frustrated me. And it frustrated Martin Fowler as well. And so Martin Fowler and I met in Chicago two weeks later. And we wrote an email to a bunch of people, Mike, Mike Beadle and Ken Schwaber and Donald, you know, all these folks that eventually went to the meeting. We wrote this letter inviting them to a meeting in the Caribbean uh, where we would discuss lightweight processes. And Alistair Coburn wrote back within hours and said, 
essentially, damn you, I was just about to send that same letter myself, uh, but I like your invitation list better than mine. Can I add my invitation list to yours? And oh, by the way, I will do all the legwork if you will agree to have it in Salt Lake City. And when someone volunteers to do work, you say yes. So it was set. We were going to do this in Salt Lake City in February and Alistair Coburn was going to set it up. And we met. <laughs> We met in the Aspen Room of the Lodge at Snowbird, 17 of us. Many, many more people were invited. Only 17 could come. It is somewhat remarkable that those 17 came because nobody was paying for this. Everyone had to come on their own budget. <laughs> so it was an expensive trip and it was a, a speculative trip. No one knew that anything would come of it. And usually meetings like this end doing nothing at all. There were 17 people there. In the end, it was all middle-aged white men. And we have been uh, severely criticized for that particular uh, content. However, uh, that was not the content of the people invited. <laughs> there were many invitations sent out that covered a much larger demographic. Several women were invited, several other folks of different heritages were invited. It just turned out that the ones who managed to come were 17 middle-aged white men. <laughs> In any case, we still had a very large diversity of viewpoints. <laughs> we may have all been white men, but we had very different views on what software was. There were people from the extreme programming camp. There were people from the scrum camp. There were people from the feature-driven development camp and the DSTM camp and the crystal camp and the, the pragmatic programmers were there. Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas were there. They didn't believe in process at all. They thought the idea of process was ridiculous. And then there was Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler remained agnostic. He stood there as a, a kind of colossus of Rhodes almost, standing over the meeting, agnostic about all, all of the various processes, but convinced that a unification of those process, processes was necessary. And then Steve Meller. Steve Meller was the scientific management guy. He was the waterfall guy. He was in there as the dissenting voice. We invited people who disagreed with us. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you're ever calling a meeting, that's a really important thing to do. Get people in the room who disagree with you. The last thing you want is a lot of groupthink. I kicked it off. Um, I, I was the first one to get up. I had called the meeting in the first place. It was my email that got everybody there. So I got up and I said, hey, I think we need a manifesto. I sat down. That was my final contribution. I don't think I added anything else to it. We did the normal kind of thing that you do at a meeting like this. You know, we wrote index cards and we sorted them on the ground and we did brainstorming stuff and we wrote stuff on a board and, and it was going nowhere. <laughs> Just, and, and that's typical. It's typical of meetings like this. They just kind of bumble around and, and everybody gets kind of frustrated. And you know everybody's thinking, oh, this isn't going anywhere. I should go home. And then the magic happened. There is some dispute about when the magic happened. Um, some people believe it was early on the second day. Uh, some people think it was late on the first day, but the magic did happen. And the magic was caused by someone writing on the board these sentences that had two components. And you can see them here on the screen. Uh, these were not the original sentences, but the, the structure was there. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That was the fundamental insight right there. It is not that, that, we, that we were saying waterfall was bad. We were saying that waterfall is good, but we prefer these other ideas a little more. And once that idea was on the board, the whole room relaxed. Everybody kind of sat back and went, yeah, yeah, that's what we're trying to say. <laughs> 
And there was this overall agreement in the room. This generally does not happen at meetings. <laughs> but all of a sudden, there was this magical agreement. And we did a little bit of wordsmithing. And the four sentences you see there came out. The, the sentences that define the Agile Manifesto, they came out. They came out very relatively rapidly. And we had this sense that we were done. We had a few more hours of cleanup meetings and decided that we would write up some principles. And, and then we all went home. And the question remains, who wrote that sentence on the board? Now, some people think it was Martin Fowler. Some people think, I happen to think it was Ward Cunningham. No one knows for sure. And it's probably best that we don't know. <laughs> but somewhere in there, the magic happened. Ward Cunningham did take a picture shortly after that. It, that is the picture that you see on the screen right now, this picture of Martin Fowler standing at the board. Uh, by the way, Martin Fowler always stood there at the board, so it's not unusual that Martin Fowler would have been standing there at the board at that particular time. Ward said, as we were all leaving, I'm gonna take this manifesto, I'm gonna put it on a website and I'm going to have people sign it. That was a stroke of genius. Uh, because, you know, usually when you go to a meeting like this, even if the meeting is successful, you don't really expect anything to come of it. But Ward did. He put this up on the agilemanifesto.org website and tens of thousands of people signed it, <laughs> which was a huge surprise to all of us. We were all going, well, what? why are there all these people signing this? And we realized that we had a movement on our hands. The group of people never met again. Um, there was correspondence by email a few times, but not much. Uh, at one point, we all decided that we never wanted to meet again. The job was done and we weren't going to try and, you know, make the lightning strike a second time. There, there have been a couple of times when some of us have regathered at a conference by invitation uh, five, five years ago, we all, or six years ago now, we met, uh, most of us met at the Agile conference, and uh, our, only, our only function was to sit on stage and have people ask us questions. And, and that really was the end of that group. The group was not, in fact, a special group. Uh, I believe another group would have come to the same conclusion. Uh, it's just that we were there at that time at the right moment. What was it? What was it that we realized? Well, you see the manifesto. You know what the manifesto looks like. It's those four sentences. But what is it that those four sentences summarize? And the best way to describe that is probably this. What you're looking at here is the circle of life. This is a diagram that was written by, by Ron Jeffries probably in the year 2002. And it is an attempt to describe what agile looks like. And in, and in this particular case, he's trying to describe extreme programming. Now, now, why do I bring extreme programming back into this? Extreme programming is the best defined of all of the agile processes. There are several agile processes. The most popular, of course, is Scrum. But Scrum is not well-defined. Or I should say it is well-defined in one aspect, but it is not well-defined in others. If you look at this diagram, you will see that there are three circles. The outer green circle are the practices of extreme programming that face outwards towards the business. The blue circle in the middle are the practices of extreme programming that face inwards towards the team. And the red circle are the engineering practices, the practices used by the programmers on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis to support the quality of the code that they are producing. Scrum is very good at defining the outer green circle. They define it slightly differently than extreme programming does, but it's a good definition. The Scrum is moderately good at describing the blue circle. 
Scrum says nothing at all about the red circle. And many of the other agile processes have similar kinds of definition problems. Extreme programming is the only one that defines them all and defines them all very strongly. Now, I am not going to go through a long discussion of the red circle, test-driven development, refactoring, simple design, and pairing. These are all deeply technical topics. If you are not aware of these topics, you must learn them. If you are a programmer and you are not practicing these things, you should start to practice them because <laughs> you are missing a huge benefit into the way that you write code. I will spend a little bit of time, however, just walking through one of the practices on the outer green circle. This is the practice that you will all recognize as agile. And it is the planning game. It is the essence of Scrum. I will go through it fairly rapidly. How do you manage a project? Well, in Agile, we manage a project by taking time and dividing time into fixed increments. This was not true of Waterfall. In Waterfall, we sort of split time into three very large increments. But in, in extreme programming or in Agile in general, we divide time into many extremely short fixed increments. The normal size of these increments is two weeks. When extreme programming began, we thought it was three weeks. When Scrum began, they thought it was four weeks. Actually, they thought it was 30 days. But all of them have coalesced around two weeks. I think it should be one week. <laughs> My opinion is that the, the size of that time slice ought to be one week long, because too much can go wrong in two weeks. And the idea, very, very straightforward, is that we are going to do all of the waterfall activities, analysis, design, and implementation, in all of these slices. We are going to do a little analysis, a little design, and a little implementation in that first week. Then we'll do a little more analysis, a little more design, a little more implementation in that second week. And we will not order it. We will not do the analysis first, the design second, and the implementation third, even within a week. We will just mix it all up. What we are doing in each week is writing code. We are writing code based on requirements that are not well-defined. This is one of the advantages of Agile. Requirements do not need to be well-defined, and we assume that they are not well-defined. We will be defining them better and better as the weeks go by. We do not have a good architecture up front. We have no idea what the architecture is going to be at the beginning. We will be creating that architecture as the weeks go by. So we will work in these slices, these time slices. And at the end of each slice, we will measure how much we got done. How will we do that? I'll describe that in a little while, but we simply measure how much we get done. And after we have done one or two slices, we can make a, a, a mathematical guess about when we're going to be done with everything. We simply multiply the time it took to get that first slice done by the number of slices we think we're going to need, and we get a date. And usually the date is way past the deadline that everybody thought they were going to meet. <laughs> the purpose of Agile is to get bad news out early. <laughs> the purpose of Agile is to know just how screwed you really are as early as possible. As we continue to develop, more and more slices get done and the certainty around that late date increases. The purpose of Agile is to destroy hope. <laughs> hope is the project killer. Hope is the thing that says, oh yes, we can make it. I know if we just put in a little extra effort, we can make it. But the mathematics of Agile stare you in the face and destroy all hope. <laughs> 
That is the goal. We want the hope destroyed. We want the cold dose of reality poured upon everyone as early as possible. People like to say that agile is a way to go faster. It is not a way to go faster. <laughs> you will not go faster by doing agile. You will simply know how slow you are going. That's what you're going to learn when you do agile. And it is not usually good news. One of the reasons that people often abandon agile is because the news is not good. <laughs> this is still software. It's still hard. Right? It's just that when you're doing agile, you really know how hard it is. <laughs> you can't lie to yourself very much. At some point, the managers look at this date and they go, well, that's impossible. We can't, we can't deliver at that date. We've got to deliver earlier than that. And they, they start to demand from the developers, you must get done earlier. And the developers come back and they say, well, okay, I mean, fine. We can, we can deliver earlier. You just have to get rid of some of these features in here. If you get rid of some of these features in here, well, then, then we can deliver earlier. <laughs> and that negotiation drives the process that ends up causing a delivery to happen with acceptable content at, a, at an acceptable date. Not the content you wanted and probably not the date you wanted, but at least acceptable content by an acceptable date. <laughs> and that's what Agile gives you. Not necessarily what you wanted, but the best outcome you can drive it to. How do we estimate in Agile? How do we estimate the size of these slices? How do, we, how do we know how much we're getting done? Well, that is a complex process that, that would take much longer than I have now to describe, but I will summarize it very simply. We break up the project into a bunch of, we call them stories. Some people call them backlog items. It does not matter what you call them. They are ill-defined, improperly defined, partially defined requirements. And then we estimate them not in time. We do not say that this will take me two weeks. We simply say that this one is a three. And then we will compare another one to it and we'll say, well, that one's a four because it's a little harder than the three. And then we'll do another one and we'll say, well, that one's a two because it's not quite as hard as the three. We use this point system usually so that we're not confounded by hours. And then we simply measure how many of those points we get done at the end of a week. And then we measure how many points we think we've got in the whole project. And that's how we calculate that end date. It's not a difficult thing to do. There are many, many rules, many, many little, little gotchas that I'm not going to go through right now. But I will say that we, we, we tend to work in these very short cycles with, with requirements that are not well-defined and with estimates that are very gut level. Not a lot of science to those estimates. This does not answer the question about how to estimate a large project for a, for a company that needs to know whether they should even authorize it or not. That's a different topic. These estimates are simply used in the process as a way to measure how much we're getting done, how fast we are going. And with that, I believe it is time for some questions and answers. So I hope you enjoyed that little trip through history. And now if you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer them, if I can read them. <laughs> so uh, let's see, Quentin asks a question. He says, um, how did programmers write unit tests and run them back in the days? <laughs> Were there unit test frameworks from the beginning? No, there weren't. Uh, that would mean the, that the entire machine back in the Mercury program were thought for that, I guess. So I don't know how the Mercury guys ran their unit tests. I have no idea. The computers that they would have had available to them would have been machines like IBM 360s, big machines, very expensive machines. I could imagine, however, that with the budget of NASA, they had access to those machines as much as they wanted. 
could they have written in assembly language a simulator for the elements of the Mercury space capsule? I assume they could. Could they then have written unit tests? And I assume they could have. I do not know if that's what they did. You'd have to go ask one of those old Mercury programmers just exactly how they did this. But it would have been conceivable. Back in those days, um, shortly after those days, because that would have been a little young even for me, but by the late 60s, I was a programmer at a, a company that used IBM 360s. And I did write unit tests, not nearly as much as I do now, but I would write tests and I could write them in assembly language uh, to run on an IBM 360. Now, I had to run them overnight, <laughs> so it was hard. We didn't have the immediate feedback, but it was still possible. It did not take long, however, for me in my career to start having a dedicated computer. This happened to me by 1970. Uh, by 1970, I was working with mini computers and many computers were cheap enough, they were still very expensive, but they were cheap enough that I could have dedicated access. Now, there were several programmers I was working with and we only had one mini computer, so we had to share it, but I could have hours long access to this machine and therefore I could write unit tests, which I did, and uh, have relatively fast feedback. Uh, in those days, a compile uh, of a program, even in assembly language, might have taken an hour and a half or so. So I could, in, a, in the span of two or three hours, I might be able to do two trials of a unit test kind of situation. This, of course, only improved as time went on. And very much like the frog boiling in a pot of water, we, we only sort of noticed <laughs> that, that the the, the, the time between compiles and the testing time was shrinking and shrinking to the point now where it's almost vanishingly small. Let's see, Morno Sebastian asks, it's been 20 years since the manifesto. Is there anything you feel is missing or outdated considering the changes you may have observed in the programming field? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't think there's anything missing or outdated. Uh, I, I believe that the Agile Manifesto does not need any kind of modification. Uh, I believe it, it stands by itself all alone. Uh, and and it, it describes a universal truth. Um, a truth that does not change with our industry. And I should point something out about our industry. Many people believe that we are working in a rapidly changing industry. This is not exactly true. From the beginning of computers until 2003, we experienced exponential growth in the hardware. Unbelievable exponential growth. The machines that I used in 1970, you see one back behind me. In fact, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen so you can get a better idea of this. Take a look at this little machine behind me with the blinking lights. Right? That's a mock-up of a PDP-8. PDP-8 would execute 500,000 instructions per second. It had 4K of 12-bit words, right? We thought it was a really powerful machine back in those days. The laptop that I am currently using right now to transmit real-time video across the internet to you 7,000 miles away is at least 22 orders of magnitude more powerful than that PDP-8. And I mean 22 orders of magnitude. If you take the the speed of the clock and the amount of memory and the amount of offline storage and the amount of money that it would take to buy these machines and the amount of power that it takes to power these machines. And you just add up all those, you easily get to 22 orders of magnitude. I have lived through this 
incredible growth in the power of these machines to the extent that we now play angry birds on a handheld device and think nothing of it. <laughs> that would have been completely unthinkable just 30 years ago. <laughs> so we expect this industry to continue like that. But it stopped. It stopped in 2003. Clock rates hit a brick wall. Clock rates have not gotten faster since 2003. My laptop sitting right here executes at 2.6 gigahertz. That's the clock rate. That's the clock rate that everything stopped at right around 2003. Computers are not getting faster. The hardware designers thought that they could sidestep that by adding more processors to the chips. So they made dual core chips in the early 2000s and then they made quad core chips in the early 2010s and then they stopped doing that too because they ran out of, of density. Our hardware has stopped. Oh, there's some little things that we can do to maybe improve it a little bit, but the exponential growth in the hardware has stopped. We programmers have not accepted that. We still think we're on an exponential growth curve. We still think everything is changing enormously and we need new languages and we need new platforms and we need new this and new that and everything has to be new all the time and there is no reason for it anymore because the hardware that supports what we do hasn't changed much oh, in the last 10, 15 years. <laughs> now, what is it that we do, we programmers? What do we do? What do we really do? We write if statements, while loops, and assignment statements. That's all. That's what we do. Sequence, selection, and iteration. Those are the three fundamental elements of all programming. Sequence, selection, and iteration. That's it. It's all we do. And our languages, although they're very complex and very, really powerful languages, they all boil down to sequence, selection, and iteration. If I took a programmer from 1968, guy who was used to working on that PDP-8 back there, and I brought him forward in time and stuck him in front of my laptop and I showed him IntelliJ or Eclipse working in Java and the virtual machine, and I showed him all that stuff, and I showed him the immense power of all the tools, that person would need 24 hours to just recover from the shock. But then they would be able to write the code because the code is not that different. The code is pretty much the same. Oh, the languages are a little bit different. And, but you know, I could take him and show him Java and he'd look at that and go, oh yeah, that's sort of like Simula. Uh, yeah, a little bit like Algol. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, it's a little, little better, a little better. I see, you know, there's some improvements, but uh, yeah, it's a lot like, you know, Simula 66 or seven, something like that. They would be able to recognize it and they would be able to write the code. <laughs> I could take you, programmer today, you know, used to working with all this high-powered stuff. I could transport you back in time to 1968, stick you in front of a PDP-8, show you how to edit programs on paper tape. You'd need 24 hours to recover from the sheer disappointment, <laughs> but you could write the code because the code is still the same. We expect change. That change is not coming anymore. We are now on the plateau. And that's something that we as programmers are going to have to face. We are on the plateau, the technological plateau. There may be some advances and some changes, but nowhere near the kinds of changes we all lived through. And therefore you have to ask yourself the question, why do we expect everything to change? <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. Mark. Mark says, uh, do you have any thoughts about this radical agility idea as shown in the following picture? Well, he gave me a link. I'm going to show this link. I'm going to click on this link and see it. Uh, Self-organization, social value of product and service, impact of li on living beings, impact on living beings, uh, becoming the desired change, becoming the desired change. Uh, listen, guys, you know, uh, here, here's what I think about that. I didn't study it. I didn't read it. Uh, I just kind of looked at it for a minute. Everybody who wants to sell something has to differentiate. 
If you, you've got a new idea, you've got to differentiate that idea from old ideas. So what we see are, and it's been a long chain of, of, of this happening, uh, consultants will come up with some way to differentiate their offering from someone else's offering. And this means that there has to be a new adjective. <laughs> and the adjective might be less, the adjective might be safe, the adjective might be skilled, the adjective might be modern, whatever the adjective is, it has to go in front of the old thing in order to differentiate the offerings of a particular consultant. I don't know if that's what that was. I suspect that's what that was. I don't know. Every time that happens, however, it dilutes the original message. It spreads the, the original message out and uh, confuses everyone. The reason that I wrote this particular book here is so that the original message could come out again. <laughs> and we could talk about you know, what Agile was and what Agile still is today, as long as we you know, sweep away the adjectives and look behind the scenes and see what Agile really is. And let's see, um, are we obliged to estimate? Yes, you are obliged to estimate. <laughs> there is this m movement out there called the no estimates movement. And if, if all you do is read the hashtag no estimates, you'll get the impression that they don't estimate. But of course they estimate. <laughs> People estimate, of course we estimate. Now, do we trust our estimates? Well, that's a whole nother matter. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't trust an estimate that a programmer gave me. I would kind of use it as a, Ooh, well, sort of, <laughs> but I'm not gonna trust it. Estimates are essential. We have to estimate. We cannot make progress if we do not estimate. But an estimate is never a promise. That's the mistake people make. An estimate is a guess and generally not a very good guess. <laughs> By the way, in Agile, just to make this point home, right? If you are doing Agile and you are working in sprints or iterations, whatever those things are called, if a sprint delivers nothing, is that a failed sprint? And the answer to that is no, it's not a failed sprint. The, the sprint does not promise to deliver anything at all. Nobody ever promises to, to deliver anything in a sprint, even though you've estimated a bunch of stories and added up all the points and, oh yeah, we think we can deliver 10 points, but at the end of the sprint, you deliver nothing. That is not a failed sprint because the purpose of a sprint is to provide data, not code, not working software, that's ancillary. The purpose of a sprint is to provide data. And there is a lot of data in a sprint that produces nothing. <laughs> you, are, you are never making a promise when you estimate how many points you can get done in a sprint. Uh, let's see, it's a great question. Are we obliged to estimate? Yeah, you're obliged to estimate. <laughs> Uh, let's see, um, back on the XP diagram, this is Sheila, Sheila Suarez Flores. Uh, back on the XP diagram, what is the metaphor? <laughs> good spot, good spot. For a long time, we looked at that metaphor thing on, the, on that diagram and thought, what the hell is that? And we would ask everybody, hey, Kent, what's metaphor? I don't know. Then the, Eric Evans wrote the book on what the metaphor is. Domain-driven design. If you have not gotten this book and read this book, uh, go get this book and read this book. It's a very, very well-explained uh, description of what metaphor is. What is metaphor? Metaphor is the language that the developers and the customers and the managers use together when they are describing the project they are working in. That's the short version. This is the long version. And that brings us to the top of the hour. Probably it's time to end this discussion. Thank you all for hanging with me and uh, listening to my historical ranting about Agile. 
And with that, I will turn it back over to our very kind hosts. Thank you very much. <clears throat> to be honest, I have had uh, two lessons today. F first lesson is about agile history, uh, its purpose, its roots. And the second, uh, second lesson is about public speaking in public. Uh, you, well, <laughs> well, you are perfect. Wow, uh, it's a real wow from me. Okay, so um, thank you really, really, really much to have been here for being here tonight. Well, for us it's tonight, but for you it's the beginning of the day. So thank you very much for having uh, for being here. And um, uh, well, you're here at home, and you come back uh, whenever you want. All right. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you again. Bye-bye. So, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, on va enchaîner. On va enchaîner. Uh, heureusement, uh, nos, 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 nos intervenants qui, uh, uh, qui suivent sont, sont tout aussi doués uh, que, que l'orateur uh, actuel. Uh, je, du coup, uh, hop, ça y est, j'en ai trouvé. Un, je cherche le deuxième que j'ai vu pas loin. Voilà. Donc on va rester dans l'international finalement. Bonsoir Cyril, bonsoir Tania. Euh, Nicolas, je ne sais pas si tu veux rester ou si tu veux. Euh, normalement, il faut que je promeuve Eric. Oui, promeuve Eric. Ouais, et moi, je, moi, je descends du coup. Tu te réviens. C'est le même. Euh, voilà. Donc, euh, toc, je peux te. Voilà. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Attends, je te demande juste.